it enhanced their perception, it enhanced their intuition, it enhanced their awareness. All the qualities of leadership came from the Mufkut, from the Shimana, from these golden cakes that they called bread. It's clear from the evidence of all these ancient things that it didn't matter what they called things. It didn't matter that they didn't understand perhaps the true science that we're beginning to understand now. What they did know is that it worked. It did certain things. And they told us about that. So even if they didn't understand it, they presented things as sort of communicating with gods and, and, and priests who were able to disappear before their very eyes and things. But these are all things that this enables to be done now. In Greek mythology, it was the one substance that sat right at the very heart of the golden fleece legend. It was what the quest was all about, the secrets of, of manufacture of this material. It's linked up with the Ark of the Covenant, that famous golden coffer that Moses had built at the uh, mountain in Sinai and took to Jerusalem where the temple was constructed to house it. So this most valuable artifact, the Ark of the Covenant, was entirely tied up with this science in some way, as we shall see. Mysterious processes concerning gold and things automatically ring alchemy bells. Pictures of, of, of wonderful wizened old chaps in, in medieval times with all sorts of potions and fires and things burning away, all trying to perfect this thing called the Philosopher's Stone, which Harry Potter has reminded us of yet again. It was in the middle 1600s, 1660, uh, that Britain's Royal Society was founded and established and chartered by King Charles II, and it was that establishment of, of that society that, that, that embodied and led to the great discoveries of people like Christopher Wren, of Edmund Halley, of Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, uh, and, and all of these tremendous characters that emerged in the, in the 1660s and 70s uh, to make scientific discoveries that had never been made before. And most of those were made on the back of the fact that they were pursuing alchemy. They were searching for the Philosopher's Stone, and during the course of it, they made lots of other discoveries. Just like today, in space research, we get for our households all sorts of other wonderful spin-offs. The discoveries of things like gravity and whatever were spin-offs from looking for the Philosopher's Stone. There was one particular fellow, um, classified today as an alchemist, although he, he was simply called a philosopher at the time. He was truly revered as a great master by the Newtons and others of the day. This fellow was called Arrhenius Philalethes. And for Arrhenius Philalethes was reckoned to be the ultimate master in that period. And Philalethes had got a little bit fed up with the church propaganda about the Philosopher's Stone being some silly device to turn base elements into gold and whatever. And he thought he'd publish material and put the record straight in the public domain. So in 1667 in Amsterdam he had a work published called Secrets Revealed. And in this he discussed the Philosopher's Stone, its nature, its qualities, what they knew about it. But most important, he made this point. Our stone is nothing but gold. Our stone is nothing but gold. It's gold digested to the highest degree of purity and subtle fixation. We call it a stone only because of its fixed nature, because it resists the action of fire as successfully as, as any stone. In species, it's more pure than any gold that it comes from. But its appearance is that of a very fine white powder. That was the Philosopher's Stone straight from the hand of the most famous chemist, alchemist of his time. We go back 200 years, we go back to the 15th century, we, we can look at the last testament of Nicholas Flamel, probably the best known of, of all the great alchemists of all time, uh, a fellow who spent 20 years from a very poor base studying his science and ended up probably as the greatest and wealthiest benefactor that France has ever known. He made the point on the 22nd of November 1416 when writing his last testament, exactly the same. Our stone is gold, but it's perfectly prepared gold. It's a fine powder of gold. That is our philosopher's stone. So we have a whole new perspective here. We have a perspective that says the philosopher's stone, despite all the propaganda, 
despite all the church has done to try and make it look silly, is not about turning anything into gold. It is gold. It's gold in the highest possible, purest form that it ever could be. And that white powder that we looked at earlier was exactly that. That was 24 karat gold. What's the gold that the Philosopher's Stone makes? The Great Enlightenment. Not the Great Enlightenment of money and wealth and riches and a lump of gold, the Great Enlightenment of wisdom and learning and intuition. That's the real Holy Grail. That's, that's the true Enlightenment. We can leap forward in time now and see how these old stories match up with what's been going on. And it begins right here in the United States, it begins in 1976, and it begins um, in Phoenix, Arizona. A very, very apt place, actually, because the word Phoenix was Old Phoenician, and it means red gold. It all began with a farmer, a cotton farmer, a third-generation cotton farmer just outside Phoenix called David Hudson. This is a picture of David Hudson as he was about five years ago. Um, he's your average American farmer. He wasn't a physicist, he wasn't a scientist, he was nothing. He certainly wasn't an alchemist. He was destined to become all of them. His father had been Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Arizona. They were farming about 70,000 acres in the Yuma Valley there. And they were growing cotton of very, very high grade. But they had a problem with their soil. Big problem with the soil. The soil was enormously alkaline. In fact, it's a strange soil there. There's no topsoil in it. There's no real nutrient as such that's apparent. It's just eroded rock dust. That's all it is. Very strange material. Its surface becomes very black and very crunchy. To the point where, at the end of a growing season, once the crop's been picked, over the ensuing months, this stuff gets so hard that it will not be penetrated by water. Now, it's not an area where it rains a lot, but their irrigation trucks were having no use with it. And this had gone on for generations. Uh, and David thought, well, it's about time to have a look at this and to try and work out what this stuff is, because it means that we have to work in rotation and we can only plant our crops in that field every three years. What, what they did to start with was that they take this substance and they, they could see that it was a combination substance, some of which was just nasty black stuff, but within it there were these white elements that, that really seemed to show up within it, and they wanted to know what they were, because this seemed to be the thing that was the, the problem. So they, they took it into the lab, they, they, they cleaned it all up, they, they actually got this stuff out of the black material into a precipitate, and, and what they then had to do was to dry that out so that they could test it. Well, the f strangest thing was happening. They, they decided the best way to dry it was simply to take the filter papers and put them out in the sunshine, just to put them outside. The moment they did that, it exploded. Now, it hadn't been that the farmland had been exploding, but the moment they separated this material and put it in the sun, something about the heat or the light exploded it. And it was explained as if it was like a flash of 40 or 50,000 flashbulbs all going off at once. Not only that, it disappeared. And they thought, well, that's, that's really strange. You know, is this an Im implosion or an explosion? What, what's going on here? It's like a great blast of this light. So they took an unsharpened pencil and just stood it on end uh, in the sample, in the, in the filter paper. Just stood it there. Bang, white light, it's gone. The pencil's still there. It hasn't blown over. It's not been affected by this. There's no blast. So they said, okay, this needs cleverer testing than we've got. So up they go to Cornell University. Now at Cornell at that time, they, they said that they got this amazing new equipment and this equipment could test anything that you'd got down to three to five parts per billion. So they put it on their machines and they came back and they said, it's iron and silica and aluminum. And they said, well, it can't be. None of those things disappear in a blaze of white light. No, I mean, none of them have these properties. There must be more to it than that. So they, they tested them again, and, and they discovered that actually the, the reading that they were getting was, was just a little impurity at the front level. It was reaching the boiling point of these particular substances. 